Hello. Today in class we talked about the Schoenberg, the Opus 11, number one of the three pieces for piano, and we were mainly focusing on all the motivic and thematic ideas that we saw uh, and heard as we listened. Uh, in this video, though, I want to get a little more detailed and talk about one of those motives that we singled out in class, and that's that first descending three note motive. So here's the score for the first five bars of Opus 11, number one. And just so we can remember what this sounds like, here it is again. and so on. We're actually going to dig, dig down even deeper than just the first five bars. We're really only going to focus on the first two measures and talk about this descending three note motive from the opening two measures. Now we referenced in class that this particular motive comes back quite a lot, so it seems to be rather important. So what makes it tick? Well, what makes any grouping of notes tick in this kind of post-tonal, or in this case even an atonal context? Well, what it comes down to are intervals, and intervals are going to play a huge role in how we talk about um, groups of notes in this atonal setting. Now, the groups of notes we'll talk about are relatively small, usually anywhere between three and five notes, and they're going to comprise some kind of motive, like in this case a descending three note motive, or this ascending five note motive between measures four and five. And it's our comparison of these motives with other similar motives that might have similar or contrasting intervallic content uh, that's going to help us to get into the piece a little bit. The, this process that we're doing with this is very analogous to assigning a Roman numeral to something in tonal music. But instead of assigning a Roman numeral, we're going to give it a more specific and somewhat more meaningful uh, label in this new context. So what do we do? How do we identify what all the intervals are? Well, we're just going to count them up. Uh, so for instance, we can we see we have the note B, G sharp, and G natural. So with any three notes, you're going to have three possible intervals. You've got the interval from the first note to the second note. You've got the interval from the second note to the third note. But then you also have the interval from the first note to the last note. And if you get all three of those, then you've accounted for all of the intervals possible, because all these are obviously work backwards as well, right? The interval from B to G sharp is the same as G sharp to B, so that's taken care of for you. So you just need to get those three intervals. So in this case, B to G sharp is going to be a major third, I'm sorry, a minor third, and then G sharp to G natural is a minor second, and then, of course, then B to G natural is going to be a major third. So those are the three intervals that we have in our grouping of three notes. Well now, what do we do with that? Well, it'd be nice if we could have some system to collect that information that was uniform and easy to see at a glance of what the interval content was for these three, measure, these three notes so that we might compare it to another three notes later and see maybe how this motive has transformed or developed as the piece continues. Turns out we do have a way to do that. And it has a really technical term, and I'm going to use the term because it's what is used to describe this term, but it's called an interval vector. It's a fancy way of saying and just listing the intervals that are in a group of notes. Uh, the interval vector looks like this. So the interval vector is going to have a spot for all of our possible intervals. So notice the first slot here would be for a minor second, the next one for a mi major second, the next one for a minor third, so on and so forth down all the way up to a tritone. So all we need to do is make an account for all of our intervals on this chart. So we just say there's one minor second, there are zero major seconds, there's one minor third, and there's one major third, and there are zero perfect fourths or tritones. And we've created the what we call the interval vector for this group of three notes. 
Now, again, you might be asking yourself, so, so what? We've got now a way to see quickly what the intervals are. How does that help us? Well, if we expand out just a little bit and now go back and look at measures 9 into 10, which is the first really appreciable return of that descending um, motive, it's very in a very similar presentation to what we saw from the beginning, this F sharp to D natural to C natural. So is that the same? Are the intervals contained in that the same? Now, at first glance, you can tell obviously they're not, right? The interval from the F sharp to the D is a major third, whereas the interval from the B to the G sharp is a minor third. But let's dig into this a little bit. Maybe there's more differences. Maybe it's more similar than we think. Maybe they're not similar at all, right? This is where the interval vector can help. So let's find all the intervals for uh, these notes from measures 9 to 10. So we have F sharp to D, which is our major third, and then D to C natural, which is a major second. And then, of course, F sharp to C natural is our tritone. So we put those now into its own chart or interval vector, to use the technical term. Uh, we see now there are zero half steps or you know, zero minor seconds, but there's one major second. Uh, there are no minor thirds, but one major third, no perfect fourths, but there is this tritone that's there. We can now compare this interval vector to the previous one, and we can see uh, where there are some similarities. Notice that the second descending motive that we've looked at contains a major third, and the first one does. But, but other than that, the intervals are all unique. Uh, they're, they're different. The minor second has become a major second, the minor third has become a major third, and it looks like that major third, remember the major third that went from the B to the G natural, has now grown to become a tritone. So in fact it looks like all of the intervals have actually increased in size. So the whole set of three notes has expanded. It's been developed, in, another, in other words, and gotten larger. So it's still reminiscent of that opening um, descending three note motive, yet it's been altered, it's been developed uh, in a, into a new set of unique pitches. So this is the kind of, of way we'll be engaging with uh, this music. It really all comes down to intervals. Now there are uh, some ways to address the intervallic content of these notes without having to manually find all of the intervals involved. There are some shortcuts. You can find uh, certain relationships uh, between the notes without having to worry about uh, the intervals. It can, some, some work's been done for you by some very smart people that can help to make this process a little bit easier. So we'll get into that as we go, but this is a brief sort of primer on the thing that really makes atonal music click, and that's dealing with individual intervals between the notes. So uh, go back and watch this again if you need to, um, to really figure out what we're talking about here and setting up the intervals on an interval vector, and we will decompress and talk about this in class on Wednesday.